Nova United Methodist Church in our April 18th, 2021 virtual worship service. We thank you for being with us today and pray that each person finds great joy and spiritual nourishment as we worship together. The call to worship today is Psalm 4, a Psalm of David. Answer me when I call to you, my righteous God. Give me relief from my distress. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. How long will you people turn my glory into shame? How long will you love delusions and seek false gods? Know that the Lord has set apart his faithful servant for himself. The Lord hears when I call to him. Tremble and do not sin. When you are on your beds, search your hearts and be silent. Offer the sacrifices of the righteous and trust in the Lord. Many, Lord, are asking, who will bring us prosperity? Let the light of your face shine on us. Fill my heart with joy when their grain and new wine abound. In peace I will lie down and sleep for you alone, Lord. Make me dwell in safety. children gather around for a message from Pastor Jim. Well good morning. It's good to see you. I want to share with you today uh, about the joy of Easter. And I hope that you had a great Easter celebration that uh, you're so glad that Jesus rose again and that you know he loves you. You know, one of the things that Jesus did as he, as he uh, uh, met with his disciples after his resurrection, he appeared to them and, and he talked to them about what it all meant. And he told them, I want you to go out now and tell the story. I want you to share with people the good news that God loves them and that they can be saved because Jesus died and rose again. He made the way. We call it the good news because it's the greatest news to know that we can have a heavenly home, to know that God loves us so much. You know, when good things happen to you in your life, you can't help but want to tell other people about it because you're so excited about it. it. It gives you such great joy. Well, that's what Jesus was saying to his disciples. He said, you know, I know how, how joyful you are that I, I'm alive again, that, that everything uh, has come true, that, that I am definitely the Messiah. I have fulfilled all scripture, that I am the way, the truth, and the life. And, you know, they were so excited. He said, yeah. Now take that excitement and go out and tell people all about me. And that's exactly what they did. You know, God loves you and God loves me. And that's something pretty exciting. That's so good to know. 
as we go through the day, we, we can think about that. You know, God loves me. And that's the greatest thing. And when we lay down at, at night and we say our prayers, we, we know that God hears us and He answers our prayers and He loves us and He wants the best for us. And that's a great feeling. And you know, that's something that we need to share with others. So if you have friends that, that don't go to church or don't really know much about God, share with them the good news, the good things that God gives to you and, and uh, invite them to come to church. Invite them to know about Jesus. That's what God would have you do. That's what Jesus would, would want you to do is to share His love with others. And I hope you'll do that. Let's have a prayer together. Dear Jesus, we thank you for loving us. We ask you to help us share with others about your love. Amen. Thank you all. I love you and look forward to seeing you next week. Let us bow our heads for prayer. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, you are the Good Shepherd, and we thank you for nurturing our life and sustaining our faith. In gratitude, we want to help others to know you and your love. Today, we think of our friends and family and ask for special blessings to them. We pray for healing for all those who are ill or dealing with long-term health issues. We pray for comfort for those who are lonely. We hope to be that one that sends a card or makes a phone call. We pray for peace to our caregivers and understand their day-to-day -day stress. We pray for comfort to those who are grieving. We pray for strength for those struggling with addictions or who may be struggling financially. We ask for understanding for our students and teachers as they finish their school year. Today, we ask a special blessing on Pastor Jim, and we continually thank you for his leadership. We also ask a blessing for each person watching this virtual service. Hear the praise or concern that is on their heart and wrap them up today in your love. We now pause to remember our tithes and offerings. Please use them to increase our ability to witness to others and to provide for your ministries. Now join me as we pray together the prayer that he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Yes, the cross made the Aimless desperation Without hope Walk the shell Of a man Was then a hand 
with a nail print stretched downward with just one touch was then a new life began and the old old rugged cross made the difference in a life bound for heartache and defeat I will praise him forever and ever Good morning. Our scripture lesson today is from the Gospel of Luke, the 24th chapter, verses 36 through 48. While they were talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, why are you frightened, and why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While in their joy they were disbelieving, and still wondering, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish. And he took it and ate it in their presence. And then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written, that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let me read that last part again. And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name, to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. When we hear the word witness, it probably brings to mind the idea of someone sitting in a courtroom 
offering a first-hand account of what they saw happen or giving an expert testimony of what they found in examining evidence in a case. We've all watched enough crime shows down through the years to know that a witness is crucial to getting to the truth about what happened. And given that the outcome of a trial greatly affects the lives of all involved, it's important that such evidence is the best it can be. Great lengths are taken to protect a crime scene, to gather evidence and accounts, to verify every statement and to work to remove all doubt so that what the jury or judge has to work with is the best evidence available. When examining a witness, the lawyers from both sides want to know if what the witness offers is first-hand knowledge or whether it might be dismissed as hearsay. The credibility of the witness may be questioned as well. Their reputation challenge. What might be at stake for them in the outcome of the trial? Well, you've watched the shows, and if you're like me, you've seen enough to know that it's not a situation that you ever want to be in. Jesus says to his disciples, You are witnesses of these things these things which Scripture prophesied and which Jesus fulfilled, that which Jesus has opened their minds to understand, so that they can go out and proclaim that repentance and forgiveness of sins is available in Jesus because He is the promised Messiah. He is the way, the truth, and the life. These disciples were the most qualified witnesses to proclaim his story because they were the ones who had personally witnessed how Jesus fulfilled all that was written about the Messiah. In fact, when it came time to replace the disciple Judas Iscariot, who had betrayed Jesus and later took his life out of regret and guilt, it was decided, as we read in Acts, the first chapter, verses 15 through 25, that one of the qualifications for filling that position was that it had to be someone who had been with them all this time, one who had seen and heard much of what the other disciples had witnessed. And they chose among the group Matthias and Justice because these two had been followers of Jesus since Jesus was baptized and began his ministry. They drew lots in Matthias, winning the lot, became the new disciple to complete the twelve. Point being, Jesus' disciples were credible witnesses. And so Jesus tells his disciples, that they are the witnesses that will fulfill the scripture regarding the spreading of the gospel to all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. It's now up to them to continue the work that Jesus had fulfilled, the sharing of God's plan of salvation to all who will believe in the testimony of these disciples. The outcome of Jesus' commissioning of these witnesses is that you and I are here today as recipients of the good news that they proclaim concerning salvation in Jesus Christ. Which brings us now to how all this calling of witnesses relates to you and me. Although we are not first-hand witnesses of Jesus' ministry and death and resurrection, we are likewise called to be His witnesses. So by what credentials do we claim credibility 
as witnesses for Jesus Christ. Our credibility as Jesus' witnesses is that we can speak of that which we actually know. We can share how Jesus has saved us and changed our lives in Him. That's our personal testimony, our good news, our gospel account. And this manner of personal witness, down through the ages, has a proven track record of convincing others to find salvation for themselves in Jesus Christ. Our own story, our own account of how Jesus came to save us, how we came to realize that we needed salvation through the presentation of personal testimony and the sharing of the gospel story in our Bibles. That's a powerful means of helping others realize their need for Christ as well. The Holy Spirit works in the hearts of those who need Christ. And our testimony, our sharing of Scripture, our concern for the lost is employed by the Holy Spirit to bring about the work of salvation in lost souls to whom we are engaged in witness. Jesus has called us to be His witnesses in the world today. And given that, I'd like to share some anecdotes that support our following Jesus' command to share the good news. First of all, we need to ask, why should I care if others hear the good news? George Sweeting in his book, The No Guilt Guide for Witnessing, tells of a man by the name of John Currier, who in 1949 was found guilty of murder and sentenced to life in prison. Later, he was transferred and paroled to work on a farm near Nashville, Tennessee. In 1968, Currier's sentence was terminated. And a letter bearing that good news was sent to him. But John never saw it. He was not told anything about it. Now life on that farm was hard without any promise for a future. But John kept working. Even after the farmer for whom he worked, he kept working. We assume that the farmer was the one who never told John about his pardon. John kept working on the farm. Ten more years passed. And then a state parole officer learned about John Currier's plight, and he went out to the farm himself and told him that his sentence had been terminated. He'd been pardoned years ago. He was a free man. And in his book, Sweeting concluded that story by asking, Would it have mattered to you if someone sent you an important message, the most important message of your life, but the message was never delivered? Year after year passes, and you never get the good news. We who have the good news, who have experienced freedom through Jesus Christ, are responsible to proclaim it to others who are still enslaved by sin. Are we doing all we can to make sure that people get the message? And next, we might ask, well, how am I supposed to witness? How do I do that? A true heart of compassion 
will let those on the way to destruction know how they can escape. But the only escape is through Jesus Christ. We need to let people know that they're in trouble with God, that God alone has provided a way to escape it. But how? Do we all have to share the good news in the same way? Well, of course not. The unbelieving world is made up of all kinds of people, young and old, rich and poor, educated, uneducated, people who live in urban settings or out in rural settings, different races, personalities values, politics, even religious backgrounds. It takes more than one way, one style, one way of evangelism to reach such a diverse world. So what's your style? The New Testament shares that the apostles had and used different styles to proclaim the good news. For example, Peter at times was confrontational. In Acts 2, we hear him preaching to the crowds at Pentecost, repent and be baptized, save yourself from this corrupt generation. Paul, is, as he sometimes witnessed, would take an intellectual, route. In Acts 17, we find that he, he is there debating with the philosophers on Mars Hill, trying to convince them of their need for Jesus Christ. In John, the ninth chapter, we have the testimonial approach, which was offered by someone that Jesus had healed, the man who was born blind. And when he was questioned, examined about how it is that he could see, he declares, one thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. In Mark 5, we hear Jesus telling the Gerasene demoniac, whom he frees from his demonic possession, when he comes and asks Jesus to go with him, Jesus turns to him and says, No, go home to your family and tell them how much the Lord has done for you. Jesus gave him a relational approach. The Samaritan woman in John 4 goes to the city where she's from and begs the people of the city to come out and hear this Jesus who has told her all about herself, this man who offers living water. She had an invitational approach. And in Acts 9, we have a beautiful testimony of one who witnesses of Jesus Christ through service. We're told of a woman by the name of Dorcas who greatly impacted the people of her city by doing acts of kindness. That's just a sample of the many ways in which we can proclaim the good news. Never think that just because you don't proclaim the gospel like Peter or Paul that your ability to witness is any less effective or any less needed. God would have you discover how you do it and then get out there and use that for the glory of God. Another aspect that we need to consider is that it's important to walk the talk. According 
to the book, The Life of Francis de Assisi. Francis once invited a young monk to join him on a trip to town to preach. Honored to be given the invitation, the monk readily accepted. And all day long, he and Francis walked through the streets, the byways, the alleys, even out into the adjoining suburbs. They rubbed shoulders with hundreds of people. At day's end, the two headed back home. Not even once had Francis addressed a crowd, nor had he talked to anyone about the gospel. Greatly disappointed, the young companion said to Francis, I thought we were going into town to preach. And Francis responded, My son, we have preached. We were preaching while we were walking. We were seen by many, and our behavior was closely watched. It is no use to walk anywhere to preach unless we preach everywhere we walk. You know, you really, you really can't help sharing the good news when you know Jesus Christ. There's a, an anecdote, a story of, about uh, some men who were panning for gold out in Montana. One of them found an unusual stone and broke it open. He was excited to see that it contained gold. So working eagerly, the men soon discovered there was an abundance of that precious metal. And happily, they began to shout with delight, We found it! We found gold! We're rich! And they had to interrupt their celebrating, though, to go into town and stock up on supplies. Before they left camp, the men all agreed not to tell a soul about their find. Indeed, no one breathed a word about it to anyone while they were in town. But much to their dismay, as they prepared to go back to their camp, there were hundreds of men ready to follow them. And when they asked the crowd, who squealed, who told? The reply came, no one had to. It showed on your faces. And finally, if you want to be successful in reaching others for Christ, it will require sacrifice. The following story is based on a sermon by a missionary by the name of Del Tar. He served 14 years in West Africa. And his story points out the price that some people pay to sow the seed of the gospel in hard soil. He shares in his article, I was always perplexed by Psalm 126 until I went to Sahel. That vast stretch of savanna, more than 4,000 miles wide, just under the Sahara Desert. In Sahel, all moisture, all the moisture comes in a four-month period, May, June, July, and August. And after that, not a drop of rain falls for eight months. The ground is so dry that it cracks. And so do your hands and your feet. The winds of the Sahara pick up dust and throw it thousands of feet into the air, and then it comes slowly drifting across West Africa as a fine grit. It gets inside your mouth. It gets inside your watch and stops it. The year's food, of course, must be grown in those four months of rain. People there grow sorghum and milo in small fields. 
October, November, well, these are beautiful months. The granaries are full, the harvest has come, the people sing and dance. They eat two meals a day. The sorghum is ground between two stones to make flour and then a mush with about the consistency of cream of wheat. The sticky mush is eaten hot. They roll it into little balls between their fingers and drop it into a bit of sauce and then pop it in their mouths. The meal lies heavy on their stomachs so they can sleep. December comes and the granaries start to recede and many families omit the morning meal. And certainly by January, not one family in 50 is still eating two meals a day. By February, the evening meal diminishes. The meal shrinks even more in March and children succumb to sickness. You don't stay well on half a meal a day. April is the month that haunts my memory, he says. For in it, you hear babies crying in the twilight. Most of the days are passed with only an evening cup of gruel. Then, inevitably, it happens. A six or seven-year-old boy comes running to his father one day with excitement. Daddy, we've got grain, he shouts. Son, you know we haven't had grain for weeks. Oh, yes, we have, the boy insists. Out in the hut where we keep the goats, there's a leather sack hanging on the wall, and I reached up and put my hand down in there. Daddy, there's grain in there. Give it to Mommy so she can make flour, and tonight our tummies can sleep. And the father stands motionless. Son, we can't do that. He explains, that's next year's seed grain. It's the only thing between us and starvation. We're waiting for the rains, and then we must use it. The rains finally arrive in May, and when they do, the young boy watches as his father takes the sack from the wall and does what the young boy thinks is the most unreasonable thing imagine, imaginable. Instead of feeding his desperately weakened family, he goes to the field, and with tears streaming down his face, he takes the precious seed and throws it out on the dirt of the plowed field. Why? Because he believes in the harvest. The seed is his. He owns it. He can do anything with it he wants. The act of sowing it hurts so much that he cries. But as the African pastors say when they preach Psalm 126, brothers and sisters, this is God's law of the harvest. Don't expect to rejoice later on unless you've been willing to sow with tears. The lesson from this story poses the question to us, the same question that Jesus was posing to his disciples as he was sending them out in the world to share the good news, to plant the seed of his word that would bring the harvest. And Jesus asked us, how much will it cost you to sow in tears? I don't mean just giving God something out of your abundance, but finding a way to say, I believe in the harvest, and so I will give what makes no sense. The world can call me unreasonable to do this, but I must sow regardless in order that I may someday celebrate with songs of joy. You see, Jesus asked us to commit our all to the work of the gospel. Our worship, our service, 
our giving, our prayers, and our witness. How much will it cost us to sow in tears? Because we believe in the heart. And all God's people said, Amen. Opportunities for Service Loose Change is designated this month for Celebration of Missions events. This is a statewide event that collects money and donated items to the various missions in West Virginia. This year, the Western District is supporting Ebenezer Community Outreach Center and the Greater Clarksburg Cooperative Parish. Shoebox Ministry is collecting small books, stickers, small stuffed animals, coloring books, activity books, and puzzle books. Non-perishable food items can be dropped by the blessing box. Special offering for the month goes to our general funds and it's called the Easter offering. Remember our church with your financial donations by check, electronic fund transfer bill pay set up through your local bank, or online giving set up through our website. Continue to check Facebook page Canova United Methodist Church and our website canovaumc.com for routine updates. Pray daily for your family, friends, community, church, and nation. Stay safe and look around you for ways to share God's love. Well, thank you for being with us in worship today. I hope that your life has been blessed by the presentation of the gospel, by the music as it is, inspires us, by prayers, by the calls to service. I ask that uh, if you're here listening to this and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, I ask that you open your heart to Him, that you hear His call, that you know that His message of love and grace, His sacrifice was for you, to help you, to bring forgiveness for the sins in your life, to give you hope and, and inspiration, to help make you what God created you to be in this world. I pray that you'll open your heart to Him. And if you do, I hope that you'll be in contact with us here at the church. And If you live in the area, to come and be part of our congregation. 
so that we can help you grow in grace as you help us likewise to do so. If you don't live here, find a church in your area and join with them. Brothers and sisters in Christ, as the scripture has spoken to us today, realize that we are called to share the gospel. Truth is, we can't help but do it because he lives. Because he lives. And I know it because he lives in my heart. When we know Jesus Christ, it shows. And we can't help but be a witness for him in this world. Employ yourself, commit yourself to the salvation of souls as Jesus has called us to do. And all God's people said, Amen.